excited to be here and excited to just bring that extra uh, cultural and language knowledge to the students. We think that's really important and a critical skill for our students to have coming up. So I want to introduce the key speaker for today. It's going to be Mr. Christopher Chesser, who is the Language Division Chief for the Air Force Culture and Language Center. So I won't read his full bio, but he provides uh, policy, direction, outreach, and oversight for the center's language division, which builds language, regional expertise, and culture capabilities throughout the Air Force with a focus on developing over 3,000 language-enabled airmen and also foreign area officers. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Mr. Chester. Thank you, Michaela. Well, that's a wonderful bio, but I was not on WSFA last night. <laughs> Raise your hand if you were on WSFA last night, because I know there's some <laughs> there's some students who were on WSFA last night. Maybe you didn't see that you were on WSFA last night, but let me tell you all something. I was a little bit jealous because it has been years since I've been on television. And when I was on television, let me tell you about the story I had to report. I was a civilian personnel director and there were job cuts that were about to happen. So I had to report some really bad news. But this is even worse. We had found a way to place the people so that there would be no job cuts. So I basically said, well, we were gonna have job cuts, but now there's no job cuts. So nobody cared about what I had to say. <laughs> I mean, you all went viral last night, and no one even remembers that I was on television. Nobody at all. Not at, not at all. So congratulations for being famous. A Keep is now famous. And thank you, Michaela, and you're super famous, right? <laughs> I want to thank you all, Kamsanida, uh, for having me here today. Anihaseyo, A Keep, and professors. I want to thank you all for what you bring to the community and what you bring to the world through your excellent education and the way that you have partnered and really bring this, uh, really brought this community together. As Michaela mentioned, we are the Air Force Culture and Language Center. And you should be proud that we have a center here at Maxwell Air Force Base that really is a center for language and cultural instruction for the Air Force and for the Space Force. And I'm gonna tell you a little, little bit about that today so that you can better understand what your base here in the Maxwell River region does for language and culture, for airmen and for service members. And today I also want to talk about some of the opportunities that the, the students in this room may have in the future with critical languages. I have worked with the Air Force Culture and Language Center for eight years, and during this time I've learned a lot about language learners. I'm a language learner, I'm a language learner but I have been far more impressed by other language learners who are more gifted in language learning than I am. So I'm going to share a few examples about some amazing Americans, some really great people who I've met over the years to include those who I observed a little bit in this room uh, this afternoon. Now I can tell you how the AFCLC manages airmen and guardians, but it might be better to do a demonstration. So I'm going to ask for three students to come up and be volunteers for me. Please, come, come on up. Volunt volunteers, three volunteers. You, you, and you. Come on up, yes, come on up. Come on around and please stand on the stage, yeah. Let me get my props together here. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you three service members, three airmen on the stage, 
This is Major Mirror. Please give Major Mirror a round of applause. <laughs> this is Lieutenant Libro. Everybody give, give a round of applause for Lieutenant Libro. <laughs> and then finally, we have Warrant Officer Window. Now, at the Air Force Culture and Language Center, we work with these three types of airmen. We work with Major Mirrors, we work with Lieutenant Libros, and we work with Warrant Officer Windows. Not literally, but you'll get the concept in a second. So I'm gonna take your mirror from you, please, sir. And I'm going to put it in front of my face. All right, so what do you see? Oh, really? How about now, what do you see? <laughs> what, what, what about now? Still see your face, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so you look, look pretty good, huh? You probably understand yourself pretty well. But if you're meeting somebody for the first time and all you see is your face and your views and your experiences, or if you assume that they are just like you, maybe they all like K-pop, <laughs> maybe they all like the sports, you can take it back, all, the, all like the sports that you like, then you are what we call at the Air Force Culture and Language Center, mirror imaging. You're assuming that they think a certain way, feel a certain way, act a certain way, like certain things, that's mirror imaging. And for the Air Force, if we assume that another that partners from another country are going to make a decision or believe something the way we believe, then we could be making a major mistake and fail to partner and fail to defend our country the way it needs to be defended. So we do work to make with the major mirrors and we try to help them understand what mirror imaging is and why it's important to really understand another culture. But let's let's look at uh, Warren Officer Window. Warren Officer Window, come over, come over here, please, ma'am. Come over this way. And we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. You're popular. Okay. So hold up your window. Put it up to your face. What do you see? People. Okay. There you go. What do you know about these people? Nothing. <laughs> Very good. You're hired. <laughs> how, how are you going to learn about these people? Ask questions. Ask questions. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So how are you going to ask questions? You're going to have to get beyond this window. Uh, anybody have moms or dads who like to shop? Raise your hand. Like the people who like to shop. Oh, okay, oh, okay. Even moms are raising their hands. Yes, I like to shop, right? If this were a window into a store, you would see some things in the store, but you wouldn't know the prices. You wouldn't know what's back in the storeroom. You wouldn't know the people in the store. So although you're, you're not looking in a mirror, but you're looking through a window, but in order to really learn something, you've got to ask questions. You've got to get beyond that window. You've got to go into the door. You've got to go out and learn things. And the same thing is, is when you are trying to work with people from another culture. Whether you're a lawyer and you're trying to work a legal issue with people from another culture, or you're a student who's learning Spanish for the first time, you have to really go inside and get to know the people behind the window. Very good. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Lieutenant. Lieutenant's ready to go. What do you, what do you have in your hand, I Lieutenant? Have a, um, I have a book, but sadly I can't read. So. Okay, okay. Well, it, it, this is a book. I like this book, Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. This is a really good book that talks about negotiation and negotiating with people from other countries. So you're a Lieutenant Libro because, anybody know what Libro means? Book. Book, very good. Got some, got lots of language skills in the, in the audience. So you're Lieutenant Libro 
And what we want our service members to have is a thirst for knowledge, to go beyond looking at themselves and what they believe, to go beyond just steering from the outside, but really getting in and trying to understand through books and through working with people from other cultures to better understand, regardless of your profession, uh, nursing, uh, mechanics, engineers, even uh, military members. Are you and military now? I used to be. I used to be. I used to be in the military. I'm going to tell you everybody knows about that. But with the Air Force Cultural Language Center, who has a who has an expeditionary field guide for Korean now? Raise your hand. Some of you. Some of you got those the other day. That's the little books I gave you. The little books. <laughs> the little books. Okay. So so those guides talk about the twelve domains of culture as it pertains to Korea. And you can find that on an app. Anybody in the audience, parents, you can do this too. If you type in AFCLC, AFCLC, in the app store, you can download this guide. And the next time you're going to Costa Rica, or the next time you're going to Africa, or certain places in Europe, you can download this guide, and it can tell you about this country before you go, and you can learn about this country. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, you can put your props down. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> so at the Air Force Culture and Language Center, we are really truly trying to understand other cultures. And one of the programs that we use, and this is the one that I oversee, is the Language Enabled Airmen Program. Currently in the Language Enabled Airmen Program, we have 3,400 service members who are developing their skills across 94 languages, and they are spread across the Air Force and the Space Force. Out of that 3,400 languages, 231 of our service members are selected to develop their language skills in Korean. That's a lot of service members who are competitively selected across the Air Force to partner with with our friends in Korea, with the Korean military, with the RACAF, uh, Republic of Korea Air Force, and uh, their other services. And I want to tell you a couple stories about service members who are members of the LEAP program. Again, remember, 94 languages. So this service member is named Major Ayers. Major Ayers, when she was a little girl, she decided she wanted to be an astronaut. How many of you would like to be an astronaut? Raise your hand. Anybody in the audience think you might be an astronaut? What about a pilot? Anybody? Maybe an engineer? Okay, there you go. There you go, okay. So Major Ayers had dreams of becoming an astronaut, and she knew she needed to be really good in math, she needed to be good in science, but then she had another idea. What about language? Uh, who goes up to the space? Uh, the Chinese go into space. Uh, Japanese go into space. Oh yeah, the Russians go into space. So when she was selected as a cadet to the Air Force Academy, she decided to take on the very challenging language of Russian. What's another challenging language? Korean. Korean's a very challenging language. So when she took on Russian, she studied it at the Air Force Academy, but then when she graduated, she didn't have anywhere else to go with Russian. But then she heard about the Language Enabled Airmen Program. And our program gave her this, the ability to continue studying Russian. Russian is such an important language. Russian, like Korean, like Chinese, like Japanese, like Arabic are strategic languages, very hard to fill, very hard to master languages. And she took on that language at the Air Force Academy and through LEAP, she's been able to maintain that language. Well, she became a pilot, and she developed her skills as a pilot, and she applied for, uh, for NASA. She applied to become an astronaut. And she was waiting for months on the results of whether or not she had been picked to be an astronaut. And one day she was in the van with her sister, and she got a text, and she looked over at her sister, and she said, oh, I got in. And they, they, and that was it. That's all they said. 
They were keeping it quiet because her niece was in the back seat and she wanted to tell her parents herself. They were all coming together for a family gathering. They got out and they opened up the van door and the niece ran out to everybody who was out in the yard. Auntie's gonna be an astronaut. The cat was out of the bag. But everybody in the family was incredibly proud of Major Ayers and what she was going to do for her country. I'm going to read to you all another story that I recently received from a member of the Language Enabled Airmen Program who was also studying a critical language. And I'm, I'm getting on up there. I, I have to get these uh, things out in order to in order to do something as difficult as reading in front of a large audience. This is about Lieutenant Kim. I want to read some things that he had to say about what he did when he was in Korea. When he went on this trip to Korea as a airman, he was working with the Marine Corps to help accomplish a training mission with our partners in Korea. And he said that he was able to enhance not only his basic Korean language skill by using it daily, but he also gained vocabulary, especially in military and tactical terms. He was able to shadow a second lieutenant from the Korean military. And he learned the word, Hilsung, victory, Hilsung, Hilsung. And that was, the, that was the rally cry for everybody because their rally cry was absolute victory, absolute victory. Because they knew that their mission was to maintain peace and stability in South Korea. And he talked about how the US Marines and the Korean Marines worked so closely together in planning and simulating combat situations. And he was able, able to see the strength and importance of the Republic of Korea and US alliance. So he goes on to tell, say some amazing things about what was going on. But this is the kind of report that we receive at the Air Force Cultural Language Center regularly of service members who are using their important strategic language skills in order to keep our country safe, in order to keep Pike Road safe. And the only way that happens is through the vehicle of foreign language. I want to tell you all a few things that I have learned about foreign language. And I am no gifted linguist. I've had the opportunity to work with administrators throughout the Air Force and really wonderful people like Lori and Michaela and others who support this important mission. But I remember the first time that I was out of the country. First time I was out of the country, I was 16 years old and I went to Canada and it was a culture shock because the guys who I was staying with took me out and did wheelies in the, wheelies in the snow in a parking lot and we were eating funny things I'd never eaten before in Ontario, Canada. And they put this guy who didn't even ride mopeds on a snowmobile. And the next thing I was flipping people over and it was just this big mess uh, for me on my very first overseas trip. But although it was Canada, and Canada seems probably pretty similar to the US, it was still a culture shock. But I was hooked. I was ready to take on more opportunities. And so when I went to college, I became part of this Partners of America's program, and I used some of my Spanish language skills to go to Guatemala for the first time. One of the weekends, we were helping with the Partners of America's program and the Peace Corps, and we were going to do a, like a four-hour hike up a mountain into a remote village where they were doing a project. And I was in pretty good shape at the time because I was in Air Force ROTC uh, for, the Air, for the military. And I happened to be near the front of the group. And so these folks were climbing up, climbing up this big mountain, and they started going faster and faster. The guys just kept on going. Well, about an hour into this, and we're in the jungle, I look behind and nobody's behind me. The rest of the group is like way behind, and I'm thinking, I'm in trouble. I'm either gonna have to stay with the, 
these leaders at the front who are going so fast, or I'm going to be lost in the jungle. So I just kept flying up this mountain, just, just climbing like we were sprinting. I'm like, this is crazy, but I had no choice. I had to stay with them. Fortunately, I was in shape. It took us three hours to get to the top of the mountain. It took four hours for the rest of the group to get to the top of the mountain. We beat them by an entire hour. We were sitting there around the campfire, drinking some tea from a root that they grew up in the mountains of Guatemala, uh, eating some black beans pasted onto some bread, you know, actually onto a corn tortilla. And I was, I was out. I was like fast asleep by about halfway through it. Lots of experiences on that trip were a culture shock. But I learned. I grew. I tried to be respectful to the customs. I ate the food. I got sick from the food. Uh, but I learned from that whole process. And that's what I see our service members do. As the Language Enabled Every Program, we match service members with homestays where they live with a family for a few weeks. We send them on exercises where they actually help out with missions. We put them in conferences where they are working with partners uh, to discuss important issues. And we put them in language classes. And they have very gifted instructors. This past year, 66 service members did Korean uh, courses through our program and to help improve the overall proficiency in Korean across the Air Force and the Space Force. And the service members, those 300 and those 231 service members who I mentioned earlier, during their time with the program, they've done 15,000 hours of online training, live synchronous online training with native level instructors. So lots of investment in the Korean, in the Korean language. But during this time, I have learned that language is perishable. You have to keep investing in it. I've learned that language is an advantage. If you know a foreign language and you put that on a resume, you're gonna look smarter already. Even if you're not as fluent as you want to be, if you're pursuing a foreign language, it's going to give you a leg up. Language is an advantage to our country and language is an advantage to whatever enterprise you support. Whether you're in the military, whether you're part of a legal profession, whether you work for a hospital, or you're, you're a manager at Walmart, it, everything that you do, everything that you do, could possibly do, can be enhanced by foreign language skills. Because thinking and living and breathing and sleeping in a foreign language really grows you as a person. And it really helps the people around you because you're a, a more well-balanced, open-minded person. You're, you're not using that mirror image uh, mindset. You're not just standing back and looking through a window, but you're actually getting in, you're reading, you're studying, you're asking questions, you're wanting to learn more about these people. And for those of you who are parents in the room, grandparents in the room, I want to thank you for supporting your students, for supporting your grandkids, for your kids, your neighbors, uh, because it's important. It's important for all of us to support cross-cultural education and foreign language education. And the work that is being done in this program here is, is amazing for Montgomery, for Alabama, for the, for the entire region. And I want to close today by sharing with you all a few other little artifacts that I, I brought with me. This victory sign uh, slash peace sign was given to me by my father. Um, he served in Korea many, many years ago. And uh, right now we have members, uh, older members in our society who served in the Korean War and uh, are not really talked about a whole lot. But the efforts that took place many, many years ago have, were just the beginning of an amazing partnership between the United States and, uh, and Korea. And today, there are still service members who are serving who think of this in terms of uh, victory and also think of this in terms of peace, in terms of what we're doing at 
on, on the military stage as, as international members of an international community. Um, so this, this means a lot to me. And for me, I also served in Korea. I was in Korea for a year as an airman. And this was, uh, has anybody seen one of these before? Or did anybody have one of these? Good. Yeah, has a little dust on it. <laughs> and this means a lot to me because this is the wolf from the wolf pack at Kunsan. And uh, our motto was defend the base, accept follow on forces, take the fight north. Because that we, we knew that at all costs we would defend uh, the, the peninsula. And that is still going on today and will continue to go on. Education is power. And you all are bringing a lot of power and punch to our country. And I want to thank you all for what you're doing as a community. I want to thank you all uh, for what you're doing as instructors and for making language a priority because it really is an advantage. It really is the future. And you are building the future. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, and I wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. <laughs>